before we all start, I know that it, it can be back-to-back -back Zoom calls for us these days, and everyone is just like focused on their screen and so on. So I want to invite everyone to take a big deep breath, just take a moment, get some water if you need to, and just settle into what we're going to be doing for the next little while. We want to make this a chill conversation, a place where everyone feels welcome, and nothing that is going to make you feel pressured or overwhelmed by video call. So diving in here. I'm excited to have this conversation because I have actually never met you before, Michael. We've been on like all these different kind of intersecting things. We have been on different WhatsApp groups and channels together. We've crossed paths at all these events. We've never actually met until COVID. Yeah. And I think that's kind of an interesting thing because now that we are doing video calls with people, now that we are connecting on the screen so much more, I'm finding that there is an opportunity to, to make these meetings actually happen for once. Are you finding the same thing? Yeah, tell them. It's, it's actually just so much easier to chat to people, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, wherever. Uh, so I love that. And so good to meet you, actually. It's so lovely. Um, I'm going to start with a bit of a depressing question. Can I ask you, what has been the biggest disappointing thing that you've missed out on in 2020 because everything went crazy? Mm. 2020. Um... I missed out on Alanis Morissette, so I'm really sad about that. <laughs> Well, no, actually, to be honest, what I missed out on the most were lots and lots of international weddings. Um, oh, nice. All my friends are now getting into the wedding season, so I was meant to fly to India for a wedding and to um, Austria and stuff. So all of them um, fell through. That's probably the biggest one for me. That's, that's disappointing. Look, um, in terms of like 2020 itself and some of the plans that you had and the plans that you had at start made, can you talk about how conditions around the world changed those plans and how you responded to them? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was super interesting for us. Um, so um, we now have two programs that start with one is the accelerator, which is for founders. And then we've got the fellowship for operators. And um, when lockdown happened in roughly March, April, we were halfway through our accelerator cohort. Um, so halfway through it, we then had to cancel our demo days, which are usually like 600 people in Sydney and Melbourne and had to completely rethink how are we going to do that um, remotely had to tell all the founders to go home and work from home and just completely repivot the program halfway through, which is a really interesting challenge. Um, and then the other part, which also happened was um, our fellowship was um, actually just kicking off. So literally the, the week that lockdowns happened, we were interviewing essentially like a hundred fellows for like 24 spots. And, um, and then had to tell the fellows who were accepted that like, rather than this being an in-person program, it's going to be a fully remote program. So understandably, everybody freaked out. They're like, oh my God, what's, what's happening? This is not what I expected. And um, really quickly though, it was actually one of the best things that happened for that community in a way, because everybody then was set at home, isolated in lockdown, but then they had those incredible 24 people around them who all supported each other. And that was just a beautiful thing which happened. Um, for us, like um, just one more thing, actually, um, which was my plan for 2020 was actually to uh, a bit crazy in hindsight, um, but it was meant to be a week in Sydney, um, a w two weeks in Melbourne, and two weeks in New Zealand, and essentially rotating that for like six months because of our New oh, Zealand wow. cohort, our Melbourne cohort. Mm. Um, and now, um, and now I'm just set in Newcastle on a couch in Newcastle, and been running like a New Zealand cohort and Australian cohort, and nobody even knows where. I am. <laughs> How do you think that is working so far? Taking the whole cohort remote, taking everything to that level. Have, has it been friction points or has it been pretty smooth? Um, yeah, that was kind of interesting. I mean, um, I think initially um, everybody was just a little bit in a frenzy of how are we going to make this work and um, experimenting with lots of different tools and, um, and solutions. Um, I mean, some of the funniest stories I've actually heard was not even in, in startup land, but actually in corporate land when um, big corporates had to transition to online and then um, people couldn't get on the Zoom, uh, like not even Zoom, sorry, because they weren't using Zoom calls. They couldn't get on other video conferencing tools because they didn't have enough seats on those software. So, uh, so they literally couldn't get on a team call because it was maxed out. So what they then figured out, which was actually the funniest thing to me was if they joined five minutes before the call, they can get it, which just means that everybody else can't get it. <laughs> so yeah, I think um, everybody went through a bit of like a friction stage. Um, and, and now it's kind of, we're hitting our strides and, and know how to do this a lot better. Have there been any memorable moments of this new remote cohort for 2020? Um, memorable moments of this cohort. Um, 
Um, we am actually one of the best ones for me and it's not necessarily, well, actually this was a moment which was um, the last fellowship cohort actually um, was um, one of 24 people and it ran fully remote, like the entire program for three months. Nobody even met each other in person. I didn't know anybody in person. And then what we managed to get in was one in-person event at the very end. And everybody actually met each other face to face. And it was just this beautiful thing where everybody's, oh my God, you're so much shorter or taller. And like all of the experiences are suddenly coming together. And that was like a magical moment because everybody grew so strongly together as a community. And then having that kind of moment of, of, of bringing that together was actually beautiful. That's fantastic. Just thinking about the theme of connecting, that's been a big thing we've been talking a lot about. Do you feel the way that you communicate and connect with people has changed in the last year? Um, yeah, um, definitely. I mean, one, I would almost like um, split it into like internally as a team and then kind mm. of externally with people as well because mm. there's a little bit of difference there. Um, and um, internally as a team, um, because we, well, actually... We're a team of four people now. And um, when Sophia started working with us in March, then she, the day she started, we went into lockdown. So she had one day in person onboarding. Well, that's rough. <laughs> yeah. And then like straight back home and we all went to the lockdown and we had to do the whole onboarding experience online. And yeah. um, that, was, that was really interesting. But then we pretty quickly transitioned into, um, into running the whole team fully remotely. And the way we do that now, I think works actually really well where... Um, we just, we have this kind of core value at Startmate that we just completely over communicate everything we do, just put it in a Slack channel. Like, like there's no judgment. There's like, mm. just throw it in there. And even if it's like a, a, a starting point, an MVP, a skeleton, just like put it in there. And we, we actually just want to see what everybody's kind of up to just to stay connected. So that's one thing which really changed in the music communication style. Like people are just way more active, which is awesome. And the other thing which we actually did, which I can totally recommend was um, just in your own time, posted like a daily stand up um, into the section as well. Like, what are you up to today? What are you going to do? Then people can actually just jump in and help you out and see where they can maybe unblock you. And then at the end of the day, um, well, actually we do that in the morning now as well. We just wrap up of like, oh, so how did yesterday actually work? Like, what, what did you, uh, what did you get to? And so it's like on the internal communication side, it's just like, establishing those routines of, of Slack communications and just setting the standards. That was actually really important to us. Mm. And um, on the external side, that's actually really interesting as well. I mean, one of the problems is that we all sit in our couches. Well, not all of us in Newcastle, but and not all of us on the couches, but we sit, all sit at home and the only people you really connect with are the people who you specifically request a meeting with, right? Like it's literally all the Zoom calls, you're really intentional of like every single person you meet with is somebody um, you want to be meeting with. And what you don't have anymore is that kind of serendipity of just bumping into somebody at South Start and just jumping in on Friday drinks or whatever that is at a coffee meeting um, and just becoming way more intentional about creating those moments. And that's kind of what, at least at Startmate, that's well, what the fellowship and the accelerator has become. Like actually, mm -hmm. how do you create that environment of just bumping into people and just facilitating interesting conversations that weren't planned? That's really interesting. I actually started at Linktree in the middle of lockdown. I've never met anyone else in the company in person, but we do this thing where we have a Slack bot that randomly hooks you up with another person in the company every single week so that you do have a, a non-work related conversation that's not intentional just to get to know other people. And I think little tools and ideas like that can actually change the way we interact online, which is really a, a nice approach. Yeah, I love that. I think Donut. Donut, donut uh, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. 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 Really also, cool. I think it even matches you up with the person you know, you interact least with. Yeah, that's also. right. Yeah. 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 yeah so, you know, I'm, I'm over in content and comms and PR, but I'm meeting people people from the dev team who would normally be like head down working on their code. And I think it's a nice way to make sure that we are meeting over the water cooler almost. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of those kinds of trends, I'd love to hear any, any trends you're seeing about how people are interacting, you know, what's new, what's changed, how, how are folks finding a way to have a conversation with each other? Yeah. Um, I think that's exactly the part which, which lots of people are still struggling with and, and we're seeing more and more of a focus on that. So 
like you were saying, like you can't have that conversation over the water cooler anymore. You can't bump into people on, in the corridor of your office. And now after four or five months, everybody's like, at first maybe went into a bit of um, a downward slope and then they were like, oh, I'm kind of enjoying this. I'm having a really flexible lifestyle. And now suddenly you're just like, oh, I actually haven't met a single new person <laughs> in the last five months. Probably not quite as bad, but, um, um, but along those lines. And I think now we will kind of start seeing that shift as well into people leaning into those, um, into that serendipity of finding essentially like a tribe, like your community of people who you love um, talking to. And as I mentioned, like the accelerator and the fellowship are great um, ways to do that. So the fellowship especially is for people who want to join a startup and actually jump into a startup. There's actually lots of other ones as well. Like um, this one community in the US, um, actually um, Jackie from Atri leads it here in Australia called On Deck. Um, which is great as well for that. And um, I think there's like a, um, I, so I wrote a Substack newsletter and somebody replied to me, there's, um, there's a website called Lunch Club as well, which is quite interesting. It matches you up with somebody for a virtual lunch randomly. And um, we, I think what, what we are essentially going to be seeing is more of those online communities, which are rather than really big, much more focused and, and having real in-depth kind of relationship with people. And do you think tools like Discord and Slack are going to become even more integral to the DNA of company culture? Um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, to a certain degree, I, like, I can't imagine our company running without Slack. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's literally, we have got this concept at um, Startnet as well, which is, we call it almost like it's a company which is unrip outable, which is like once you've integrated it into your company stack, there's literally no way for you to not be able to use it. Similar to once you are, for example, in the Salesforce CRM tool, you literally like cannot transition out of Salesforce um, unless you spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on a consultant to get you That's out of it. it. Yeah. <laughs> so in terms of the, the tech ecosystem, this has been a, a strange year for tech companies in Australia. Can I get a sense check for you? How do you think we're doing? What are, what are we struggling with and what does the future look like? Um, yeah, so, I mean, I have no idea what's actually going to happen. Um, and, yeah, I mean, it's a super interesting environment um, just to observe what's going on. Of There's uh, officially a recession now, but the stock market's going up anyway. So it's like, who knows what's actually going to happen. Um, it has it's a, been a really interesting learning experience for me to just observe what is kind of happening in the market. I mean, um, even though lots of people were talking about doom and gloom, the larger uh, um, or raised large funds and um, you've got oh i think my internet connection is unstable i hope it's going to get better in a second okay That's there we go okay and i'm back again <laughs> yeah and um and the, the only other thing is that some of the smaller funds probably had to delay their um, fundraising a little bit but even um, just the announcement yesterday um, was awesome by um, James Alexander and Hugh um, Stevens that they just raised a um, Galileo VC fund, um, a $10 million um, VC fund, which is awesome. So I actually think what's going to happen is we'll be seeing more of those soon and more, more of the smaller funds raised. I mean, what I can tell you from a first-hand experience is at Startmate, um, Everybody, we were also scared, like, oh, what if we can't actually fundraise and what if we, what if we, what if we can't actually make, get the money to invest in our startups? And Startnet is probably the company which has the finger on its pulse the most in terms of the fundraising kind of ecosystem and environment because we go out fundraising every single six months. Every single cohort we raise, we literally raise a new fund for that cohort. And um, we were just even comparing 2019 to 2020, we've raised double the funds um, this year than last year. We've That's fantastic. Raised, yeah, so it, there's a lot of uh, there's still lots of appetite. There's lots of people who want to even investing. Um, we've this year raised over three million dollars um, to invest in startups, and maybe the story there was really interesting. Where um, I um, we raised our first New Zealand fund, and that was also in the middle of COVID. Like everybody was getting scared of like what's going to happen, and we still managed to raise um, a six hundred thousand dollar fund in New Zealand, even though nobody knew us in New Zealand yet. Which is just goes to show that there's still a lot of interest. Um, Do you think that's a level of confidence in the tech ecosystem itself or a level of confidence in Startmate and the brand that you've built there? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's definitely a mix of both. Um, 
on the one side, like I would love to believe that it's only the brand of StartMate, <laughs> but on the other side, it's, it kind of goes to show that, um, especially in New Zealand, we didn't necessarily have a brand yet. So it actually goes to show that it is, it has to do with people wanting to still invest in the startup ecosystem as well. And um, yeah, so it's definitely a mix of both. In terms of going out there and raising the new fund, were you, were you daunted by the, the impact that COVID was going to have on certain industries? Was, it, was there a hesitation to go and fundraise from certain areas? Um, yeah, good question. As in, um, I mean, you can always um, expect the classic answer of um, raising right now for a travel startup is not the best time, etc. cetera. Um, but then on the other side, what you need to remember as a founder as well when you're fundraising is that um, investors invest in like a 10, 15 year horizon, right? Like whatever is going to happen in the next six months and year or three years in the grand scheme of things, like it doesn't actually matter. Like what matters is that you will be an incredible company in 10 to 15 years time. So investors, especially in VC, um, have to think really long term. Um, so for us specifically, when we we're going out fundraising. I mean, StartMate is quite unique in a way as well. Like um, at StartMate, every single one of our investors is a founder or an ex-founder or somebody who scaled a startup um, um, in a certain unit before. So we don't necessarily, we never go out fundraising from um, the superannuation funds, et cetera. And we specifically want to get that money and get it back to founders who can then accelerate this whole ecosystem further. So it's quite, it's a, it's a bit of a different investor segment for us. So when I was targeting people, I literally was just like, you're an awesome person. Tell me free out of awesome people. <laughs> that is brilliant. Yeah. And you're getting those people who are passionate about startups to, to give their passion back to that community. Absolutely. I mean, that's kind of the thesis of StartMate. It is essentially founders helping founders. And because that's the people who can um, emphasize the most with you. They're the people who are a couple of steps ahead, who felt your pain and um, who can really give you the meaningful advice, but also support. In terms of that support, I, I want to ask about mental health. This is not an easy time for anyone. And you have this community of founders and being an entrepreneur is not easy. You're, you're facing so much doubt and uncertainty now more than ever. How do you plan to support the mental health of your founders? How are you doing that now? And, and what is that like? Mm, absolutely i mean it's a super important topic and and like you said it's never easy um what we've done at startmate is now experimented over the last two years of how can we support our funders in different ways so we've actually um done a bunch of different things from executive coaching on one-on-one -on -one sessions to mental health um coaching who are available for our cohort um once a week um to um, a full two-day co course as well on mental health and helping our founders and kind of what we've landed on with this cohort is to make an even bigger commitment to our founders so um, we are actually running um, a search inside yourself session with Craig Davis um, who is amazing at it and we do that every single week for the founders or founders come and it's like literally this um, we do it for the first six weeks of the 12 weeks of the program and like so we have a huge commitment to that it is really, really important. I mean, having a startup is already an incredibly hard thing to do. Oh, it is. Yeah, yeah hugely. In times, yeah. in times like this, it's even harder. So, like, of course, we, we need, need to and want to lean into that. Yeah. No, but thanks so much for raising that. that. That's super important. I think it is as well. And because it's all about that human element of these tech companies. Because technology is not just about code. And it's not just about platforms. It's about the people who are impacted at the end of it. Do you think that Startmates current cohorts, the companies you've worked with before, do you think you have that connection to, to humanity and what makes tech so important? Um, yeah, that's a um, great question as well. I mean, the biggest shift for us as an accelerator um, and also as a fellowship has been the one of um, rather than all sitting in the space right next to each other and just be able to throw a question in a room and then um, go for a late dinner and just bond over all the bad things which happened, all the good things which happened. Um, you can't do that anymore, right? So like, how do you recreate the human element um, of a virtual cohort? And that's actually been something that we've been thinking a lot about. And, um, and again, he experimented with a bunch of different things. And as I was talking about uh, kind of creating those forums and spaces for serendipity to happen, that is actually exactly our job as a startmate team. How do we facilitate those things? And um, so they just happen naturally. Um, 
So would I say we've done a great job? I mean, you can always do a better job. Um, do we have forums and spaces to do that? We've done a couple of different things to do that. Um, so one thing which is really important is actually do a proper onboarding at the beginning. Just people, give people their structures, the permission, their, um, just the security and safety that you are a part of a community where you can just talk about everything and anything. And then the second part, which um, we've been done is implement those kind of structures and um, almost like spaces for founders to engage with each other. So maybe just one example is every, every single morning um, between nine and 9.30, I literally have an open um, Zoom with anybody who wants to jump in from the cohort to talk to me um, or to talk to any other founders. It's literally just an optional thing in there. I'm there every single morning for 30 minutes. Sometimes I sit there by myself. Um, other times I've got five or six founders jump in. Um, but it is exactly that's what it's there for. If they feel like a chat, if they feel like asking me anything, um, they jump in there and just chat. Yeah. And to me, that sums up what I've always really admired about what you do at Startmate. It's such a personal approach and it really does, it does feel like you look at the founders as actual human beings, not just people who are scaling companies. And I think that's something to really admire about everything you do in the program. So thank you for that. No, and thanks so much. I mean, that is literally all that Startmate is about. Like we don't invest in, we're completely industry agnostic. We don't invest in spaces. We don't invest in products. Um, we are 100% founder driven. Like for us, it is the human at its center. We invest in people and um, we believe, we essentially what we give people is just a belief in themselves. We want to believe in people before they believe in themselves. And that's actually what's, because ultimately that's the only way to then make something amazing. If we were to tell somebody what to do, they would never be able to do that. But we want to believe in somebody else's vision and passion. And that's actually where the beauty comes from. That is honestly an amazing note to finish on. Believe in people before they believe in themselves. You know, if we could all do that, I think we could change so much. I think that's really inspiring. Thank you so much, Michael. Thanks so much. We might jump into some Q&A now. There's a bunch of great questions that I can see lining up here. So the first one from Georgia. How do you build community in a digital realm? Mm. Yeah, um, so here, um, and we had a chat about this with Danielle um, earlier as well. Um, and um, it's a really interesting space here where um, you, one of the things which we've learned is you absolutely want to be breaking community down into smaller elements. So that's, that's kind of like the essence of it, of um, rather than having a really, really large ecosystem, you want to then enable those little pockets um, to happen. And what you want to do is almost expose lots of people to each other. Because as we all know, like we won't click with every single person. We won't get along with every single, like not every person will become our best friend forever. Um, but what is actually really cool about the online world is that now you can actually facilitate that really quick connection with lots of different people. And um, the other one, which is actually really interesting, and uh, sorry, like I'm um, kind of sidestepping That's this great. question yeah. a little bit, is, um, is um, usually... I mean, what we used to do is um, hang out on Friday night drinks and you've got a room of a hundred people and you're the awkward one there and you just don't know even to talk to who to talk to anymore. You don't even know how to bump into a conversation because there's already a group in there and it always, for somebody who's not that um, comfortable in, in speaking to people, it is very uncomfortable. But now with the online world, it, you actually just jump into this facilitated space where like, you know, the rules of engagement, you have conversations one-on-one. -on -one, people give you an agenda to talk about and there's never, or there's rarely that awkwardness of actually like you actually have the permission to engage with people, which is actually really interesting in um, building those online communities. Essentially people feel like they have a space and they have a reason to talk rather than just like having to put yourself out there. Yeah. What is the, here's another question. What is the Startmate methodology? How does Startmate work? Um, Wow, wow. Okay, so this is a big question. <laughs> um, we, well, actually, maybe I'll start with a little bit of the history, which um, is um, what Startmate's been around for 10 years now. Um, and essentially, we started as an accelerator of founders helping founders. We invest in founders and we build a community around that. And to be completely honest with you, we've gone through a bit of an identity crisis over the last two years because we then expanded. Um, the accelerator into a fellowship and now we're kind of building this program for investors so, and the identity crisis being well we're not just about founders anymore we're actually not just about founders helping founders we're also now about operators helping operators and investors helping investors so but now we actually reframe this a little bit into um 
we are the epicenter of startups in Australia and New Zealand. And the way I would actually describe it is um, what I would see StartNet becoming is a city of seamless trust of free roads converging, which is essentially founders, operators, and investors all coming together in this beautiful com community. How does StartNet actually work? So back to your question. <laughs> um, we, um, at the moment, we've got two programs um, and it is program based. So we have two accelerators a year and two cohorts where we invest $75,000 in every um, startup um, as part of the cohort. We always invest the latest valuation of that startup. Um, and then our, well, all of our investors invest money in StartNet and we invest in our startups. On the other side, we've got the fellowship, which is um, for um, operators who want to jump into startups and actually work for a startup, which kind of brings the community together. Because what we realized is what we can support our founders with is um, fundraising, sales and marketing, right? But once you've got that money, well, you want to hire awesome people. So that's why we've got this fellowship now to bring awesome people into this ecosystem. And the way the oper um, this fellowship works is that um, you apply. So we had 600 um, people apply. We now have a cohort of 100 fellows who all, put, uh, who all uh, pay $1,000 to participate in the program. And then we expose them to this whole ecosystem and help them land jobs in the startup ecosystem. Um, so this is how StartNet works at its essence. And I know, sorry, I went very macro on you, but I hope I brought it down. Well, that's good. That's, that's what we want. The question is from Nicole. In the context of the Australian innovation ecosystem, what are the key opportunities that you see arising post-COVID? Yeah, well, um, um, what are the key opportunities? I mean, um, again, I might actually just answer this a bit more macro and then mm, try to go on the course, macro yeah. level. <laughs> on the macro level, it is a really interesting time to be investing in startups right now. Um, because um, even though I was saying in terms of fundraising and appetite in market to invest is actually still quite a lot. Um, but on the other side, if you look at the numbers of just the sheer number of people who are unemployed has never been higher. And that's actually an interesting trend in a way because um, w when you get unemployed, you still want to do things. And what then often happens is that people start startups, right? So out of like actually a side project or to do something and you've got all those awesome people starting startups. And now it's actually, that is my prediction, at least like in the next six to 12 months, you'll be seeing lots of those startups actually coming out of those pockets, which are really interesting. Um, in terms of the actual opportunities, um, um, I think one of the really interesting opportunities is the one of, um, of you can actually build anything in a matter of hours now. Like I've, um, I've just had a conversation with like a bunch of students um, a couple of days ago and they're like, hey, I'm working on this project and I've got this startup. I'm like, oh, awesome, send it through to me. And they're like, oh, here's an MVP. And it was literally like made on like Notion and Webflow and just hacked together. It looked stunning and beautiful, like a proper startup and everything front and back end. And they just did it all with no code tools and without actually having to be a developer. So it's actually starting has never been easier and actually building whatever you're thinking about has never been easier. So I think that's a huge opportunity of like whatever your passion and dream is, you can actually now make it work cheaper and faster than ever before. If you follow me on Twitter, this is something I talk about all the time. The no-code <laughs> movement, the no-code community, I'm obsessed with it because democratizing the internet and bringing everyone to a place where we can all have an equal opportunity to build is hugely important to me. So I really love that, that excites you too. <laughs> you should have talked about that. Yeah. Um, okay, another question here from Chris. I'd love to learn more about your journey. How did you make the switch from finance to tech? Oh, um my journey okay i'll give you a kind of two minute story here um which was um i was um so i'm originally austrian and polish i moved to the uk to study and i had no idea what i wanted to study so i took a book of every single degree there was in university i ripped out every page that i didn't want to study and i was kind of stuck with business and management and um <laughs> that was the most generic thing i could find so then i finished studying and surprise surprise i still didn't know what i wanted to do so they were, I was like, oh, the most generic thing you can do, which every company is a little bit of, is finance. So I went to, into American Express and did P&Ls and balance sheets. And it was really good to like build out my kind of Excel skills and Google Sheet skills and structure things. But I realized I really wanted to work with people. And um, 
And then again, like the traditional business path, I didn't, did the master's in international management, which is again, like the most generic thing you can literally imagine and, um, and went into consulting and the consulting was really good and fun. You talk, uh, talk to lots of people, you were working with lots of people, but you never had an impact and make a real impact on something. You always just recommended changes. And that's when I moved to Australia roughly six to seven years ago. And, um, and I just wanted a big change. I just wanted to work on something completely different. To be completely honest with you, I actually had this um, view because I came on a work and travel visa. I wanted to work in a bar. And because never, I've never actually worked in a bar, I really wanted to. It's fun. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, um, but um, what actually ended up happening is I posted on the Facebook group um, of our alumni network and was just like, hey, who's got a job for me? And um, it ended up being a friend of a friend of a friend who was the CEO of Mad Pause. And at the time, the company was only two people big. And I joined a startup. Essentially, it's just like the jack of all trades and just to jump in and do anything. And that's how I made the jump. That was literally um, a random experience of um, just jump in, do everything. I was literally on calls with pet sitters and dog owners and um and alexis the ceo was um was great in the way that um he was just like oh yeah let's do a bit of uh, facebook marketing but like does anybody know anything about facebook marketing no all right everybody gets a hundred bucks and whoever gets the most views and clicks wins <laughs> and it was just that's like so cool yeah. yeah it was just this environment of like now you actually were just experimenting and doing um, um just like i, I loved it because you were actually making a real impact on people's lives um and, and it was really, really fun. Um, and this is how then my journey continued from Mad Pause into Expert 360, um, where I was there for two and a half years. We raised the Series A and the Series B. And then I kind of decided that rather than working with one startup, how can I work with 30 startups a year, which is how I ended up at Startmate. Awesome. Okay. We have a question here about the Startmate Fellowship. What advice do you have for future applicants, people who might not think that they are the right fit for the program? Um, um, what advice would I have? I mean, if you, I actually genuinely don't think there is not a right fit for the program in a way. Mm -hmm. like it is one of those things where um, it is exactly there for people to figure out what they want to be doing in life. It is exactly, if you don't think you're right for the program, it means you already have a preconception of what right is, but it's almost like it challenges you on that. So many of our fellows actually start with, I want to do X. And then after eight weeks, they're like, oh my God, I'd never realized there was Y, Z, and et cetera, all out there as well. All the different career paths and all those different exciting companies I've never heard of. And um, that's, that's, that would be my advice. Of like, don't make the judgment too early. Just actually try it out. On the other side, um, um, what advice would I have to fellows is um, talk to fellows who have been part of the program, talk to alumni. Um, on the other side, we also run a conference just before the fellowship um, so people get exposed to it. So what I can recommend as well, you can watch all the replays um, of our liminal conference, jump on the website and you've got every single speaker on there. And if that excites you, then the fellowship is that just times 100. Awesome. Okay. There's a question here, which I think is really nice. And I'd love to, I'd love to break this one down. It says, you're the most transparent and open person. Is there anything you're reluctant to share with others? <laughs> and now we're going to make you share it, apparently. <laughs> Are you anything that you're reluctant to share with others? Um, I, that's an interesting question of just like, I... Whenever people ask me a question, I always give them the straightforward answer and there's nothing I'm hiding or would ever hide. Like if you ask me a super hard question, I will answer it anyway. Um, and it's just like, it's one of those things where um, I always say bad news builds trust. It's one of those things where like, when you tell people the bad things, they actually trust you more and they respect you for it. And that's when people can really help you. So that's where it gets really interesting. And um, what am I reluctant to share with others? Um, I don't, I don't know. Like, honestly, ask me anything. <laughs> Biggest regret. Biggest regret. Um, wow. Well, um, biggest regret. Oh, no, I don't know. Like, I'm actually just like, in my head, I'm going to like biggest mistake of my life. <laughs> Do it. What's that <laughs> one? <laughs> <laughs> it's 
uh, there was a really random one actually in my first job ever. Um, which, well, not first job ever, but like in my first professional job, which was at American Express um, when I was in finance. And my biggest mistake I've done, which was um, really interesting was, oh man, don't tell anybody, but <laughs> it was a while ago as well. It was like 10 years ago. Um, and um, essentially what happened was um, I was doing the budgeting for um, different countries at American Express and we were doing the budget forecast for the next year. And each country had their own forecast and I was doing it for Austria and the Netherlands. Um, and for some reason, um, I inputted all the numbers correctly. It was all fine, but I inputted the wrong currency. And nobody actually realized and noticed until um, roughly three, four months into the year when we started realizing that, that we were overspending like 10 times what we were budgeting for. And that created like this budget gap in American Express for $20 million, uh, which was pretty bad. <laughs> Now that is a story. <laughs> That's a story to hold. <laughs> but you survived it. You survived that mistake. That's good. I survived it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. My biggest mistake was sending the wrong email to 600,000 subscribers. That was a journey. Yeah. Um, oh, no. I didn't survive that one, but you live and you learn, right? <laughs> I think um, pretty much everybody's done that now on MailChimp. <laughs> yeah, honestly. It's always the first uh, name tag. The first name. <laughs> That's it. Um, just another question here. What specifically do you look for in founders? Mm. Um, what I look for is, is two things, I think. Like one is um, just people working on their life's mission. So literally like somebody who is that exciting it was excited about that area and the problem area that they literally will not stop talking about it and the mind revolves around it they think about it day and night it's been a huge thing for them for years and years and they're obsessed with solving a real problem and that is actually once you meet that person it's just like that you're almost um you will almost describe them as obsessed because that's that's something huge they want to be solving and on the other side um it's that is not enough. The second part, which I always look for, is kind of that unique insight into something really interesting that they've, um, that they've found that nobody else is thinking about it in the same way or um, has expressed it in that much clarity in a way. And that, that combination of the two then becomes really interesting. Because lots of us can be really obsessed about a certain problem space. But then actually um, coupled together with like that unique way of thinking and different way of looking at it, that's when it gets really exciting. As an operations guru, what are some of the best management and productivity tools that you can recommend? <laughs> Apart from Slack. Oh man, this is like a conversation for a whole hour or two. It um, is. I, 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 I can keep on going. We'll go until four o'clock. How's that sound? Yeah. Uh, but I genuinely do give a um, productivity workshop um, to every fellowship and accelerator cohort and, um, and a bunch of other accelerators as well. And it usually goes for an hour of me just talking really, really fast because it really should go for two hours. Um, but what are the best management and productivity tools? Um, honestly, if I give you one tip is just um, subscribe to my Substack. <laughs> it's just bartko.os.substack.com. Um, and I... And then chat. Just yeah, chat. perfect. <laughs> and um, essentially, I, I cover lots of that in my subject already. But if I had to tell you about um, one tip of um, productivity and management, um, which works really well, is um, I actually could give you, I'll give you two. <laughs> I'll give you a personal one and the work one. And I'll start, start with the work one. The work one is something that um, what we call a Drollo OS, an Adrolo operating system was um, initially the idea was by the founder of Adrolo, Ben uh, and, um, and Duncan, who that's why we call it after them. It's a start med alumni company as well. But um, essentially what it is, is um, you um, being really conscious about how you spend your time at work um, of reflecting back how did you spend your last week, then thinking about what are your top three priorities for the next week and then really consciously blocking out time in your calendar to get those three priorities done. But it doesn't stop there. Like the next important step is then write it down and share it with your whole team. And that actually the element of sharing with everybody makes it a lot more real because you think about it way more. And the sharing element of it allows people to also jump in and help you where they can, which is really interesting. So it is two reasons why it's really good. One is because you really consciously plan 
your week and your priorities and two because you actually reflect back as well and that's how you, that's the only way you improve and get better at anything the second tool um or not tool but like kind of um, system in a way is um something that was um um written up by nick crocker originally like years and years ago which um, we call elephants and um essentially it is a group of um create a group around you of three to four of your closest friends um, and that's why we call them kind of elephants of like a um, almost like a squad of elephants and um and then kind of just share everything with them come up with a plan of a, literally like a 10-year plan break it down to three years one year a quarter and and just update each other weekly how you're going on that plan but don't just create a plan also create it across all the segments of your life so that it is work and professional intellectual family finances um um, friendships etc like family it's got all those different elements in there as well it's all in my blog post too and what you then look at is your life holistically across all those areas and once you start filling in the blanks they suddenly start all fitting together which is the really nice feeling and what you then do is update each other on your kind of progress with your friends every single week and that is then a mechanism for you to keep each other accountable as close as friends but also support each other to achieve those goals so it's got this beautiful dual structure and it's one of the best things i've ever done like i've been i've had my elephant group for um i think over uh, almost two years or just over two years and it's just like strengthens those relationships so much and pushes you so much further along as well the advice i often give people on this topic is that life is a juggling act and you have some of your juggling balls are going to be made of glass and some made of rubber. And so there are some that you can afford to drop and there are some that you absolutely have to keep in the air at all times. And the important part is just recognizing which are which. Yeah, oh, I love that actually. And the elephants is really interesting because I've also been going through changes where I realized some of those balls are actually not as important as I thought yeah. they were. And you realize which ones are actually important to you. Definitely. I think that might be all we have time for today. So we'll wrap this one up here. But it has been really lovely speaking to you, Michael, and to finally meet you as well, um, almost in person, 80% in person, 80, 20. Well, um, but it's been really good to meet you. And thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much. Thanks for yeah. having me. Thank you, Michael, from us too. <laughs> I can't believe nobody asked about the hoodie strings. I was the only person. I thought someone would say, those are monster. But anyway. Nice jumper. Um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. And hopefully, fingers and toes crossed, we can meet in person at Southside next year. Absolutely. Um, so let's put those thoughts into the atmosphere. Um, for everyone joining, I hope you took uh, many valuable learnings away from today. Um, the recording of this webinar, I'll call it, um, will be made available on YouTube later on in the week. And I'm just posting a link in the chat uh, which provides access to our other events that we've got coming up. So we have a chat with Chester Osborne, uh, the creator and the brains behind the Darrenberg Cube, as well as Sally Ann Williams from Kakata Innovations and many more amazing humans. So uh, without further ado, I guess <laughs> that's what the saying off? is. Um, yeah, we'll sign out now. Many thanks, folks. Thanks for joining us on your lunch, everyone. Thank and you yeah, so much. next week, more adventures. Thanks, we'll Michael. See you all soon. Be Thank safe. You so much. Keep rocking. See ya. In the currently free world.